Hey folks, it's Joe. I'm taking off for the holiday this week, so we're revisiting one of our favorite episodes featuring the great Sarah Lund. This episode came out over three years ago, and I can't tell you how grateful I am that I get to make this show every week. Thanks to all of you for supporting us over the years, and if you're newer to the show, I think you'll really appreciate hearing Sarah's story. If you haven't already, please give us a review on Apple Podcasts. It'll help more people discover the show. See you next week. This is Joe Wong. Welcome to The Trap Set, where each week we explore the lives of drummers. I want to play something for you. Hearing Look a Ghost by Unwound, featuring my guest Sarah Lund on drums. Sarah joined the Olympia Washington based band in 1992 and anchored its beautifully discordant songs with distinctive syncopated beats performed with a monumental sense of groove. Following Unwound's dissolution in 2002, Sarah's worked with artists such as Corin Tucker, Hungry Ghost, and The Secret Drum Band. She also earned a master's degree in library science and works as a reading teacher. Recently, she collaborated with her unwound bandmates to compile reissues of their influential back catalog for the renowned Numero Group label. I spoke to Sarah at her home in Portland, Oregon, where she lives with her young son, teaches drum lessons, and makes delicious soup. And now my conversation with Sarah Lund. I mostly grew up in Bloomington, Indiana. And you spent most of your time in Bloomington with your mom as a kid? Yeah, well, we lived there all together. And then when I was like 11, we all moved to Olympia. I have one brother. And then after a year, my mom moved back to Bloomington. Got it. I stayed another year in Olympia with my dad. And then I moved back to Bloomington and finished high school. What was your dad studying? He has a PhD in folklore. Ooh. So he moved to Olympia to become the Washington State folklorist. Um, my dad actually would bring me along when he was doing his field work for his PhD. He did, he did his um, dissertation on uh, commercial fishers in the lower Ohio Valley. <laughs> so it was like really rural communities in southern Indiana um, that lived along the river. And he did a lot of just like walking up to people's door, knocking on their door and seeing if they'd sit down and talk to him. And by having a little girl with him, they were more likely to open the door and let him in. (laughs) So he was using you. So he was using me, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) What did your mom do? My mom, mostly as a kid, she was just sort of this and that, you know, raising the kids and also... You know, she worked at a fabric store for a while. She drove a van for senior citizens. And then at some point when my brother was a baby, she started uh, delivering newspapers. She was like a rural newspaper route driver, um, mostly because she could bring my baby brother with her when she worked. And then when she was in her mid-30s, she got really into pottery. And now she is a full-time, self-employed potter. And that is her job, and that's what she's been doing for a long couple decades now. Were you uh, a happy kid in general? I think I was a happy kid. It wasn't until um, puberty that I became unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> so right around the time your parents were splitting up, yeah, you were going Yeah, I mean, it, all, it was a perfect storm of puberty and home breaking so 
and that, and then is that when you turned punk to music? Rock came <laughs> yeah, into yeah, my life go. and saved me. <laughs> How did punk rock come into your life? I feel like it was seventh grade, and at that point, I was so I had skipped a grade, so I was a little younger. I was like <clears throat> eleven, I think. Well, so when I was eleven, I saw Prince. And I saw Sheila E. open for Prince, which was a totally mind-blowing experience. <laughs> in Indianapolis? In Indianapolis. It was the Purple Rain Tour. Wow. And, uh, and I had just started playing drums that year in school. Who took band. you to that? My mom, because I begged her. She went just kind of kicking and screaming. But my best friend and I begged our moms. They took us to that. I mean, that's the only time anything like that ever happened <laughs> i didn't get taken to any other giant concerts that i wanted to go to so <laughs> well that's a good one to go to yeah really i mean is there anyone else that you would have rather seen at that time point in time no okay but my mom thought prince and all of that was just horrible so what, what she kind really of did your she really took a bullet to? going to that <laughs> So you saw Prince when you were 11 years I old. I saw Prince when I was 11. Then shortly after that... But more importantly, I saw Sheila E. Okay. Opening for Prince. And was she playing in his she band? She was not playing in his band. This was before she was playing in his band, because this was Prince and the Revolution. Mm -hmm. So she was doing her thing where she was standing up yes. in front of the stage with yep. her... Timbales. Her setup and like throwing her glow-in-the-dark sticks up in the air and spinning around in circles and catching them. And just being totally mind blowing. So you saw <laughs> Sheila E when you were eleven. Mm -hmm. Then soon after that, uh, oh, so puberty starts. Soon after that, Your it was split within up. that. It was like around that time that my dad. So my dad moved out to Olympia to s get all settled in a year before we came out. So that was the year that he was gone, and during that time, things definitely were like falling apart with my parents but did he start dating somebody in olympia he did not start dating someone in olympia but my mom on the other hand started dating someone else in bloomington yes but we all moved out to olympia anyway but it was during that year my that seventh grade year in bloomington the new friends that i made in my new school like I probably, the first part of the year, I was trying to get, make inroads with the popular kids, and within maybe like a month or two, realized like, these are not my people. I can't afford to hang out with these people. <laughs> um, and then, and then just kind of met like a couple seventh graders, but mostly eighth graders who were the punk kids, and you know, my friend April gave me the Sex Pistols record and and I just was really drawn to those people and the way they were with each other and what and do you mean by that um <clears throat> it was just it was like fun and smart assy and uh but like having each other's back in a way like it was like a tribal thing like a gang you know it yeah. was it was to get you know more anthropological about it <laughs> it was like i found my tribe you know Tell me about how you started playing drums. So I had to, I started taking piano lessons when I was six, and that was that, like, you have to take piano lessons. You'll thank us later. Kind Did of you thing. enjoy it? I'm sure there were times that I enjoyed it. I feel like I spent a lot of time really battling it, and I'm doing that exact same thing to my son now. Ha, ha, ha. 
forcing him to take piano lessons. But uh, so when I started, so I went to, um, for three years of elementary school, starting in third grade, I went to this little hippie alternative school um, where you would sit, sit around and sing folk songs, <laughs> hippie songs and stuff, but we, there wasn't really a music program or anything. So then in seventh grade when I started in public school, there was band. And as I was sitting in the office with my mom registering for classes and they were talking about electives, my mom said, if you join band and pick an instrument, you won't have to take piano lessons anymore. And I said, okay, I'll do that. And they said, well, what do you want to play? And I just said, drums. I just kind of plopped out of nowhere into my brain at that moment. <laughs> so before then, you hadn't <clears throat> fantasized about playing drums. You weren't particularly fascinated by them? It, not that... I really remember. I mean, there may have been a there may have been a Sheila E thing <laughs> happening very deep in your <laughs> psyche. But um I mean, I think that I always I always as a kid and like even to this day have been a little more felt a little more like tomboy and was like especially as a kid was really more like well, I want to do what the boys are doing. Was there a time when you started aspiring to become a professional drummer or when you knew that that's what you wanted to do with your life? When I was 15, I started playing in a, like my first real band, which is the only all-girl band I've ever been in. But my bandmates were 26 and 22, and I was 15. <laughs> And I think that part of the why I think they were just like, hey, everybody, look, we have a 15 year old girl drummer. Isn't yeah. that cute? <laughs> 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 and uh, and we did. Th we did. What was the name of the band? The Fixations. That's a good name. <laughs> I hated it at the time. It's so funny. Now I think it's funny. But did you write your own music? We did. Yeah. Um, we wrote our own music. And then... Uh, Did you make any recordings? Yeah, we ha I have a cassette tape of the fixations. Okay. <laughs> We're going to put some of that on Oh, this. shit. <laughs> <laughs> if you want. Was it extremely thrilling? Were you like, wow, this is the greatest thing ever? Or That, I, don't, I feel like that didn't really click in until my third band experience, also still in Bloomington. And that was more like... as like a 17 or 18 year old. And that was like a three, another three piece. And we were called Mo, M O E, hmm. not to be confused with that other M O E band. Right. <laughs> and we, we really wrote songs together and like, like that was also about the same time that I discovered the Jesus lizard and they, Jesus lizard, like, totally changed my life around playing the drums and listening to music. Like I was really into the Buzzcocks too. I spent a lot of time listening to the Buzzcocks. Love that drummer. But then the Jesus Lizard, like that groove just really hit me in the sweet spot for me. And that right. really was like, yeah, the sense. groove, that is what is speaking to me in terms of like, the kind of drumming that I can really connect to. And, um, and you know, and then going backwards and like discovering Scratch Acid and Rape Man and Ray Washam's drumming is just like, that guy is just like phenomenal drumming. And, but Mac McNeely, who I could see, like I could go see the Jesus Lizard right. and see him play and see him do. Like that was another thing is like mostly being into <clears throat> drummers and music that I could only listen to and couldn't see, and then actually seeing a drummer who do what I wanted to do. When you were watching Mac, were you like, I'm going to do that? I'm going to do that, yeah. I maybe can't do that now, but I'm going to do it as close as I can. And the feel, like, 
if I can replicate this feel, you know, like maybe I won't be able to pull off a fill in the way that he can pull off, but, but I can completely relate to that feel and I can make that happen. This episode of The Trap Set is brought to you in part by Colectivo Coffee, handmade coffee since 1993. Check them out online at colectivo.com. What was your first impression when you saw Unwound? Well, the funny thing is that I had actually met those guys like a, maybe a little less than a year, like around the, I had come out to Olympia for Christmas that year, the year of like Christmas to New Year's 90 to 91. And um, <clears throat> they were Giant Henry <laughs> at the time. Don't remember meeting Vern at all, but I remember meeting Justin and Brant and ended up hanging out with Brant a little more during that time that I was in Olympia. So when I came and so when I saw them, I was like, oh, it's those guys. But now they have a different band name. Um, the music they were making was not t- hugely different from the band that I had been in Mo uh and as as, and over that year that they like started playing more and 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 I would see them more I totally became a fan then Brant quit Unwound and he told me that he quit Unwound like the day that he did it or something like I remember sitting with him on a curb outside of a show and him telling me I quit my band today. And the first thing that went into my head was, Oh, I wonder if I could do that. It's like if your friend told you he was getting a divorce, you'd be like, Hmm, I wonder (laughs) if I can step in. Yeah. Yes. But I was also much like when your friends break up, Right. (laughs) I was also like, but I wouldn't want to do it if it would upset Brandt. You know, I would want to be like, maybe I would want to do that, but not if it's going to be a problem for Brant. Yeah. And um, so when it came around to us actually trying to play together, or when it came around to me actually joining the band, I was like, well, I don't really want to play those songs. We should, we got to start over again. And it was, to me, it was sort of like out of, it was a way of, of respecting Brant. Like that was Brant's band. Those were his songs. Now let's do something different. Um, it's like a lioness eating (laughs) the offspring (laughs) of the previous mate. Oh, yes. (laughs) Wow. I'm not totally sure like how the connections were made, but, uh, people, suggested me I expressed interest whatever and I've heard you ask other people this but yes it's the first time I played with them I was like yes this is it you can't do that (laughs) 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 okay rewind pause go ahead ask a question (laughs) did you feel an instant connection to unwound the first time you played together yes I did absolutely Mm -hmm. see the bad thing about this show (laughs) Having, uh, we, we've been around for about a year now, and now that people are hearing it before I interview them, it's getting a little meta. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you feel an instant connection with podcasting the first time you interviewed someone? <laughs> <laughs> How would you describe the band dynamic? How did it work? How did you write songs? How did you function? How did you operate? <clears throat> um, I feel like we wrote really collaborati- collaboratively, like we... We spent a lot of time playing together. As a drummer, how would you write with everybody else? Would you write melodic ideas as well as no. rhythmic ideas? No, it was more like, like this. This was a like we we just would play f- 
for hours. We would just jam <laughs> for hours. And we would just play off of each other and really like, honestly, like the player that each, and I've said this a million times in other contexts, like the player that each one of us became is completely because of those other two people. So Unwound was a pretty influential band, but when you were in the midst of the band, did it feel like you were making headway? Did it feel like you guys were doing what you'd always wanted to do? Um, we, it's what, weird. What were your ambitions as well, a band? See, that's the, that's the thing that is kind of a weird thing to think about retroactively. Cause I don't know how, I don't know really what kind of ambitions we really had. Like that's kind of the big thing about the history of like that particular time and music and Olympia is like having ambition was kind of frowned upon you know like right. there was this real aversion to success do you feel like that kind of attitude can only take hold in privileged settings probably <laughs> i think so yeah right i think that I people mean, that are sense. that have nothing want to be successful right yeah i mean at least the people that i've spoken with from a musical sense sure they did, had no bones about wanting to make a bunch of money playing music or being famous yeah yeah, I'm well I'm sure that's true of that that particular scene. Like that scene other versions of punk scenes that I have like the earlier version of the Olympia punk scene and maybe like versions of the punk scene that I saw in Indiana where it was m actually more like poor kids that poor white kids that were into it. Um I don't know. Right. But in that time and place in Olympia, there was a lot of, and, and, you know, and Vern actually, who's the, the one guy of the band of any of us who comes from the most humble of roots probably had the most, and like he was the guy, he was the only one of us who was like, who would like count the money and, <laughs> and like, talk to the you know when it came time to talk to a lawyer about something like he would talk to the lawyer or he would you know talk to the booking agent or that like Justin and I were like oh we don't want to have anything to do with the business and Vern was like interested in it and what do you think that why do you think that people were so averse to success or ambition in Olympia well I I what did I it mean, represent I really think that there is like a pretty big connection with like what we saw happening in Seattle and and like how it it really like now we know that there's more to it but it really looked like success killed Kurt Cobain you know and that was and he was like came out of that scene in right. Libya and uh <clears throat> and just seeing the way that it just seemed like really gross and destructive you know like a really corrupted and um and at the same time really having that having that dc uh model to look at as an alternative like a, a concrete alternative like doing it on your own terms um and not uh compromising like you don't you don't have to do it the way that the Seattle bands are doing it. You right. could do it the way that the DC bands are doing it, you know. And um but somehow like m messages getting mixed about like success and ambition like obviously those guys in DC had ambition on their <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> um and and you know certainly like i think i think that you know a lot of the the riot girls had ambition too to get yeah. their message across but not but really on their own terms you know and i think that was that was the big sort of takeaway from both of those realities was like get your message out there but on your own terms and we didn't really have and we didn't have a message we were just you didn't we were just playing the music that we liked playing. How did the band change? Why did it stop functioning? <clears throat> well, 
We had a person in our band who had always been a heavy drinker and it started catching up with him pretty seriously. And it's no secret who it was. But um Who was it? It was Vern. <laughs> and he also had a baby and he had a lot of like a big crazy thing happen in his life like with the relationship change and having a baby and that was all happening like while we were in the middle of working on our last record <clears throat> and so by the time our record was done and we were getting ready to tour for it he had a six month old baby um and that had never that had certainly never been in place before and we were still young we were still just in our we're like 26 or something you know we, we didn't have any idea like what that meant and how that would affect I don't think he even really understood like how that would affect being gone and um and while we were gone like in the middle of the tour 9-11 happened like mm -hmm. right when we were supposed to be playing in New York and everyone thought the world was ending and his family was calling him asking him to come home and we were like we're not going to tell you what to do man but that's bullshit <laughs> we still have a tour to finish you know like we're here we have a job to do but the baby will be waiting for you when you get back <laughs> yeah <laughs> and that and so, you know, ultimately it was his choice to stay, but, you know, it was hard. Go ahead, it was you can hard. call him a pussy right now. I'm not going to call him. <laughs> I'm not calling him a pussy. I'm saying that we're all culpable in some way. I'm not going to put it all on him. Like, his drinking problem was his drinking problem. Right. But the way that we as, th like, three people who were pretty not prepared to deal with a, a life situation as big as that. Like we never really confronted him about his drinking until it was way too late. And he never really, you know, he didn't ask for help or if he did, we didn't recognize it because we had terrible communication skills in the band, like wretched communication <laughs> skills. And uh, <clears throat> like we could communicate we could spend hours playing music together and it was fantastic. And then as soon as we stopped and like the talking part happened, it would be like, Oh, get me out of here. <laughs> Why do you think you had such a hard time communicating verbally? Oh, well we all had our own like passive aggressive inability to like be real with each other, I think. And, and like conflict aversion, and, um, what was your coping mechanism? Uh, I just, I had a very, I had a totally, I had a separate life from them. Yeah. Like they were like, they had grown up together. So that was sort of set in place. That there was a dynamic that was set in place from the very beginning. They were these two, you know, when I joined the band, we were all like 18, 19 years old. They had both dropped out of high school, grew up together in Tumwater. I had moved there from somewhere else, was like going to college. <laughs> right. Um and uh what there was just a lot of like being like just like pissy with you. whatever just like that way of that dudes talk to each other <laughs> and i could f hang with it to a certain extent but you know and i certainly i can do that too just be like where you're just constantly constantly making fun of each other and like never a kind word for each other <laughs> like and um but I had like my other friends that so we would like come home from tour and I would not see them unless we were practicing like we didn't really hang out like 
that can be really healthy though. Yeah. You know, spending that much time with Getting somebody, some space you need some space. Other. Yeah. Right. And, and I do think that there's, there's a connection between like, between that way that we sort of like didn't communicate and therefore didn't fight. And the fact that we were able to be a band as long as we were, cause we were a band for, for that age and that time, 10, 11 years. That's a long time to exist in the number of records that we put out, you know, cause we didn't really ever fight. We just like shoved it down in our little hollow legs. Do you talk to those guys now? Yeah. You know, well, Justin and I have become actually very close friends in our old age. Like we, we have, we've actually like gone way past that and have gotten to a point in our friendship where we can be really like, open and vulnerable and real and like supportive of each other as friends. Unfortunately, um, neither one of us has much of a relationship with Vern right now. Um, but we, you know, a lot of things came out during the preparations for that, for the box sets. And, and you put out a box set on numero group. Numero group put out four different box sets that spanned that included all of our records. After the band broke up, did you freak out? I mean, that was your identity for a long time. It was a slow, it took, it was a little bit of a slow burn in terms of freak out. Like, I think that I, like, found myself drift into this, like, depression and identity crisis that I didn't even necessarily realize was happening. I didn't think that it would change my life so much. I think that I thought um, that Justin and I would just immediately start another band or that I would immediately just get in another band or something. But what I didn't realize was that it was really hard for me to play with other people. Like I had just played with those guys in that way and come to find out that's not how everybody, that's not how everybody works. That's not the dynamic that happens when a bunch of musicians get together and play. It's like often it's like one person calling the shots. I wasn't used to having anyone tell me what they wanted me to do, you know, <clears throat> or, um, just not being able to like instantly connect musically with whoever I was trying to play with. And it wasn't even like, I didn't like play with a whole bunch of people or anything. And maybe once or twice someone asked if I wanted to join their band. And I just said no, cause I wasn't ready and it felt weird, you know, yes. it's, it's totally like yes. getting a divorce or a br breaking up and figuring out how to date again. Like, it's not like you can just be like, Oh, I'll get another husband yeah. tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. No problem. I couldn't, you know, in, in the same way that, you know, like w w we basically broke up because we couldn't, we like Vern didn't want to tour anymore. And it was just like, not sustainable sustainable like we couldn't be a band and not tour and we couldn't be a band like constantly having to make these like compromises for whatever was happening in Vern's life and um you know some people reacted to the and our booking agent included reacted to that like well, just get another bass player I mean that's what everybody else does right and that was just not an option at all. And uh, <clears throat> so it was, it was hard. It was hard for me to, it took me several years to be able to actually find myself connecting to other people in, musically 
And it was really, it was a total identity. Was that partially like learning how to communicate in a broader way with different personality types and broadening your own skill set? Or was it more that you just found another band that communicated in a similar way to Unwound? I think there was definitely an, an element of like, of letting go of that and, you know, opening up to other possibilities and other ways of communicating musically. And, <clears throat> but also, um, the, be- the, the, the best, um, and longest lasting connection that I've made musically since then has been with my bandmate, Andrew Price in Hungry Ghost. And when he and I, he and I have known each other, like we met at Evergreen like 20 plus years ago. And he was in a band called Irving Claw Trio, who were my buddies and they were a great band. And then he totally dropped out of music and like really went and pursued this totally other life. Hedge fund manager? (laughs) (laughs) Therapist. Okay. Same diff. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So when he and I reconnected, like he had just been starting to think about playing again. And we started jamming together. And I think it was this perfect sort of like we'd both been away from playing long enough that it was almost like, it was almost like being at that... um, fresh raw state again where we were we could just like feel each other out with no real expectations and just kind of like see what happened organically and we had like all the same musical um references and tastes and interests and so it was easy for us to like understand what the other was getting at musically um and even and then and we played together as a two piece for a while and then we got a bass player for a while who also came in as someone who had been in bands she was in the drags and then like totally dropped out of music for 10 years to raise a family and then like decided to say play music again and like also was at that like raw malleable like it's like starting over but not from total scratch I still know how to play my instrument but I'm starting over in terms of like learning how to play with other people again tell me about where you're at right now on a day-to-day level how do you feel? <laughs> Are you happy? Um, yeah, it varies. You know, like I, I'm doing a lot of, I've, I'm doing a lot of cool music stuff and I've really ramped it up in the last couple of years. Um, I'm like, I've got Hungry Ghosts. I'm in this thing called the Secret Drum Band, which is this like, mostly percussion ensemble there's like five drummers and a couple of noisemakers and I have this <clears throat> duo where I collaborate with this phenomenal keyboard player Tolum McDonis but we only like connect once a year because he's always on the road and um Justin from Unwound just made a record and I played on the record and and uh and really like staying creative musically is absolutely what's like saved my life in the last couple of years of like dealing with the end, you know, having my life like kind of implode. And uh, so, you know, I'm not done with that. I'm not a whole healed person from the the dissolution of my marriage, but um, I absolutely credit music for getting me through it do you i think feel like I, you know who you are more or less like do you think you have a pretty good understanding i always of yourself? thought i did and i'm feeling like i'm re i'm learning and uh, i'm seeing things about myself that i didn't know were there before like i'm having a different 
I'm seeing myself from a different perspective now because I'm, you know, examining a lot of choices that I've made or not made or whatever at this point in, you might call it a midlife crisis. <laughs> um, do you feel like you're in crisis? Uh, a little less so now than even six months ago, but, um, but yeah, I don't think I'm out of the woods yet. I don't think I've landed. I don't think I've totally landed yet. Well, Sarah Lund, thank you so much for spending so much time with me. You're welcome. The Trap Set is produced by me, Joe Wong, along with Chris Karwowski, who also edits the program. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Trap Set. And visit our website, thetrapset.net, to subscribe to our show for free. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please donate to our show. If you can't afford to donate, please tell a friend and give us a good rating on iTunes. Send your feedback and guest requests to thetrapset at gmail.com. Trap Set.